want some chow fun now. <laughs> okay. We've got some, yeah, some, this stuff is, I mean, I, you know, what happens is you start doing this stuff and I want to welcome people who've joined us, just joined us. Thank you. Um, what I discover about this is it, it, you, when you start to sort of get it, you realize just how worthwhile it is and how, how, what a gift this stuff is really and truly. And it's a gift to me to share this with you. It really is. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'girei Torah. So here we are with the share. So I wanted to go back and do the Torah Tamima. I, I can't help it. I know I should just stick to the Rashi, but I can't help it. It's just... Oh, we enjoy much. the Torah Tamima. What, what, what verse is it that we are doing? This is the one on, that we did yesterday. Vayakom melech hadash. Right, this Rashi basically quotes mm -hmm. this from Sota 11a. Okay. Uh, a new king arose. Pligi Rav Ushmoel. Rav, these two great Amoraim disagree with each other. Chadamar Chadash Mamash. One said he was really new, was a new, brand new king. Amar Shenit Chadshug Zerotav. And the other one said, no, 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 no. It's, uh, well, maybe it's not, no, 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 no. He says the point is that his his edicts were on a whole new basis. He took a whole new approach, new policies. Manda Amar Chadash Mamash, what's the basis of the argument? The one who says that he really was a new king. Dichtiv Chadash, he says, that's the pshat. That's what it means. He was new, new king. Umanda Amar Shinit Chadshuk Zerotav, and the one who said, no, 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 the point is that his policies were new because it doesn't say uh, that the previous king died and a new king ruled, governed. And uh, I'm going to ask somebody to mute, please. Please mute. It's, I can hear a lot of incidental sounds. All right, so here we go with bit. And according to this interpretation, that his his policies, his edicts were totally new. We need to look into this more, more carefully, a little bit. The Faresh Halashon Vayakum. So what it what it revolves around is this phrase Vayakum Melech Hadash. This phrase, a new king arose. Kevan, why? The law come. Because he says, and this this took me a while to puzzle out because there's there's no uh, there, there, there's no uh, punctuation marks. He's saying because the word come, the word come doesn't really belong here at all. It, it's a weird weird word to use in this phrase. But ulai and maybe we can explain the usage of this word vayakom arose. Got up, got up. Shekam al Yisrael begzerotav, that he rose up against the Jewish people, against Israel, by his edicts. And he gives some examples. Milashon vayakom kain al hevel echav. We have this phrase in the Torah before, back in, in early Genesis, where it says, Cain arose against his brother Abel. So there's that word, vayakom. And another example, it's similar to a man rising against his, his neighbor to attack him. And despite the fact that given these examples I've just given, that he's given, right? Hayat Sarich Lomarit should have said, Al Yisrael. It should have said, Vayakom Melech. Al Yisrael or Melech Hadash Al Yisrael or something like that. Here, Ach Yesh Lomar. You could still say Hakavana Belashon Al Mitzrayim. That when it says he arose Al Mitzrayim, right? It says Vayakom. Go back to the actual verse. Excuse me itself, right? Melech uh, Al Mitzrayim. Right against, so he's saying this word al is similar to al uh, uh, al kayin, right? Echav, okay. So it's similar to the use of this vayakom al is is 
is is saying like rose against attacked i.e attacked so he says it doesn't it's strange right that it should say it should have said al yisrael let's find the place back here um that when he says, and he's got another, he explains this language, all right, uh, that the intent, that when it uses this terminology against Egypt, he means it's just, it's an ellipsis, that what he meant was against the, the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt, and how does he get this? He, it's similar to the usage of the language the city of Shushan was perplexed. So, and likewise, and this is the Megillah, of course, Megillah is there, where it says, that it was, uh, you know, shining and happy, full of rejoicing, was full of rejoicing. It, I shouldn't use the word, I'm sorry, not shining, but just, they were full of joy, right? They were dancing in the streets because when it uses the word Shushan there, it doesn't mean all the inhabitants of Shushan. It refers to the Jewish people who were living there. So likewise, the Jewish people living in Egypt, when it says al Mitzrayim, or de Yeshlomar, or you can say, that the person who holds that his 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 policies, his edicts were totally new, right? You could say, and I think Lauren, I think you mentioned this yesterday, that you could also hold that the new, he was a new king with new edicts. But that this person with that opinion adds to that drasha, shagam nidchatshuk zerotav. Not only he was a new broom that swept clean, and and his diuk right his he he puts an emphasis on this word chadash, not so much on the vayakom but on the chadash. Yaan de shem chadash yunach al pirov because in general and why so he's he's fussing over this word chadash because. The word that, that using this noun chadash, yunach al pirov, that usually it's used in connection with, for the most part, lamela chadash mi mishpacha chadasha, that if it's going to say new, new, then it means a king from a whole new dynasty, from a whole new different family. Mishel hamelech akodim, from the previous king. In other words, because However, there was nothing to suggest this originally. Malka mishpachat paro. Sorry, meik. So let me make sure I can read the syntax here. Right, right. Sorry, meikha. Meikara malka mishpachat paro. Originally, the family of Pharaoh was ruling. Because it, it suggests that now it's also the dynasty of Pharaoh. There's no suggestion of a new dynasty. And if that's the case, in other words, there's no suggestion when it says Melech Hadash that a whole new dynasty was ruling because it was the Paro dynasty. The Imkain Havalomar, and if it were the case that it meant a whole new dynasty, which is appropriate for the word Chadash, Vayakum Melech Acher. So if it's not the new a new dynasty, it should have written a different king, another, or rather another king. Instead of Vayakum Melech Hadash, it should have said Vayakum Melech Acher. Veda and no. Rabbi Eliezer, Perik Yud Aleph, that in the this midrash called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer in chapter eleven, the Chenhu Hayashar, and there's also another midrash called Sefer Hayashar, 
מינה במספר המלאכים שמלכו מסוף העולם ועד סופו, they, they count out, they, they spell out the number of kings, okay, who ruled from one end of the world to the other end of the world, et Yosef. They include Yosef as one of these great kings who had empires. When they say so far, long, but so far, they're talking about the known world at the time. Vezir Lishono, and now he's going to quote. Arba'im shana haya Yosef mishne lemelech bemitzrayim. For 40 years, Joseph was second in command to the king in Mitzrayim. Arba'im shana malach la'atzmo, and another 40 years, he ruled by himself. He alone was ruling Egypt. Dichtiv vayakom melech hadash, because it says here, vayakom melech hadash, a new king arose. In other words, not from Joseph's family, and that's why it's hadash. Adkan l'shono, end of quote. Ve'eno mevo'ar tam hara'aya, but Where's the proof for this? There's no clarification as to how he gets this. The Yeshlomar, the Diyek, and it's possible to say, one can argue, the Diyek Kidiyuk Hagamara, and you could say that this is similar, that he, he draws us out from the emphasis placed within the Gemara. This the, the attention, so to speak. A, a diuk is when you, you pay special attention to a word and you, and you derive um, interpretations through it. Because it doesn't say, it doesn't say the former king died and the new king ruled. And this particular midrash here does not hold that that uh, doesn't hold the Gemara's suggestion here that his edicts were new that he had whole new policies. Umefaresh and and he explains the kahe adasamichle the sof parsha vayachi because what. The, the point is that the book of Exodus follows the book of Genesis. And in Parsha Vayachi, if you look at the last verse of Parsha Vayachi, the very last verse talks about Joseph dying and being buried in a casket in Mitzrayim. And after that, we start the book of Exodus, and it says, in the book of Exodus, it says, Vayakom Melech Hadash a new king arose. And if you assume that Joseph was the king, and it says there, Joseph died, now we have this new king. The Imkain, and if this is the case, mashma, it implies, then the Kodem Malach Yosef, that prior to this new king, Joseph was in fact the king. Or the Fize, and according to this, and if that's the case, Things are, the language is, makes sense. It all sort of fits together. Prior to that, he died. That is, Joseph died. And afterwards arose. And this is exactly what it talks about, that this king, this new king, arose. That's the analysis. So you can see it's it's extremely penetrating. Uh, let's see here. Okay, just one more. It's not a long one. Asher lo yada et Yosef. He did not know Joseph. He didn't recognize Joseph. De have done, me. Say that again. Can I, can yes, I, can I absolutely. add something? Yes. Um, Joseph died before his brothers. Yes, he did. So that would mean that his brothers would have known this new king. Possibly. Possibly. I, I had the impression always that they were talking about, you know, uh, several generations before the new action starts, right? So, when the Pharaoh starts clamping down on the Bene Israel and then starts, you know, oppress. Right. It, things were good for a while. Well, they but not often. were fruitful. Mostly. No, by the way, Notice how things can turn around on a dime very, very quickly. 
It just, you know, things depend on personalities so much on, you know, individuals with huge amounts of power can change things very, very much for everybody else. The other piece too that you might be interested in is that when it, it'll talk a little later about, um, about Amram, okay, that is Moses' father, who marries the daughter of Levi, the daughter of Levi, and that's Yochevet. Yochevet is considered to be, in other words, he married an aunt, uh, I believe that would make it. And, and, and that Yochevet is considered Bat Levi. So it's quite possible that, um, you know, that some of the brothers may have been around. And if Joseph died 110, yes, so yeah, the brothers already started the Shibuim, already saw or experienced the Shibuim beginning. So we're not talking about that much time between the one and the other. Can I ask, what, what is the support for the idea that, that Joseph was king? Um, well, it's, it's besides the, the fact that, it, you know, he died and then the new king arose that because that seems to make pretty, uh, I know, pretty, I know. It's pretty, pretty, pretty remarkable. Okay, so the, this, it's not like I can give you a, a, a proof, you know, without any question about I don't know what happened to my shear here, by the way, I have no idea what just here. <laughs> I don't know if it disappeared for you too. Oh, there it is. It's back. Um, I think two things. One is that there had the very if if you allow for the fact that this phrase Vayakom Melachadash has all the implications that we are drawing from it. Uh, number one, that it just makes a lot more sense if we say that Joseph was in fact the ruler, even though it doesn't say it explicitly. But something else too, as I, I mentioned this before. When Joseph arrived in Egypt and stood before Pharaoh to interpret his dreams, how old was he? It says explicitly in the text, 30. he was 30 years 30. old, and he died at 110, meaning that he lived another 80 years. And, and, the, and what I think, I, I don't know why I thought I read this somewhere else, but that uh, it seems to me unless I was just sort of figuring it out, that for 40 years he was, I think it says so, there it is, oh, I'm sorry, it said it explicitly, Arba'im Shana, for 40 years, right? 40 years, Arba'im Shana, Aya Yosef Mishlele Melech Mitzrayim. For 40 years, Joseph was the second in command, for Arba'im Shana Melech Latzmo. And for 40 years, and so that takes care of the 80 years that he felt that he, that he lived. It also says he was second in command yes. for 40 years. For 40 years and after that and so the previous pharaoh died the one he was second in command to i mean he certainly seems to come across that he's quite a bit older than joseph he dies and joseph takes over I mean, the very would that, yeah. i'm not convinced oh, no. okay. Please <laughs> Why would they that? he was this foreigner why would they have, um, the Muslim have allowed a foreigner to to rule them for 40 years Actually, that's quite common by the way if you study history you will see that it is not uncommon for people to choose a king from a different family. That is not uncommon. Okay. But if the Torah wanted... Let, let me back up, let me back up so to, to just answer your question, Sherbet. It is not a compelling proof. No one is trying to suggest that it's a compelling mm -hmm. proof. I like to make a distinction. There are two types of proofs. There are good proofs or suge good suggestive proofs, and there are compelling proofs. This is not a compelling proof, but it does allow things to fit together and make a little bit more sense. The assumption is that we're having some issues with this phrase, Vayako Melechadash. If you don't have any problems with it, if you don't sense the tension within those words and, and, and the fact that they are problematic, okay, in their syntax, you don't, you don't, this will not, this will not con convince you of anything. But if you feel that we need to search for something to make sense, that'll make the maximum sense out of this. And the truth is, that's the basis of many hypotheses. In other words, what you do is you, you have a conundrum and you try to think of what makes the most sense. And very, very often, what makes the most sense, I don't know if we'd say it's an Occam's razor approach as well, okay, turns out to be the truth. 
you know. Um, I, I, the, the example I love to give is that I believe that there are, there's a mountain range between uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula and, and, and the, you know, in the Bering Strait, if, if I have my geography correct. And this was a theory, it was a hypothesis. Because according to the person who was the geographer or the, who, or the geologist who, who was studying this stuff, it just made sense. And then they checked it out and it was true, there is. So, you know, I don't think, you know, your one's belief in Judaism isn't gonna crumble if you don't buy this particular theory. No. It's just- No, it, in, my, in my case, I would just say that the Yaakov Melech Hadash al Mitzrayim doesn't necessarily imply the exact same thing as Yaakov Kaina al Hevel Achiv. Now, I'd have to try to uh, try to prove it. The only examples we got here of uh, Yaakov al are mean someone rose up to attack somebody else. That's correct. And there might be other, but, but it would help my case if there were other examples of Vayakum Al, where it just means what it seems to mean here, which is somebody rose up over somebody else. Okay, so um, you'll have to find them. I mean, you can get to a, you can get, go to a, you know, concordance and take a look and see what else, you know, of under Vayakum and see what other examples there are. I don't think, I don't feel that uh, Baruch HaLevi Epstein is saying this is a, you know, this is a compelling evidence. He's saying there is supportive evidence for this particular position. I think what he is doing is he's entertaining, uh, and in both senses of that word, uh, you know, an alternative understanding uh, and a deeper understanding of the, of the language of the, of, the, of the Torah here. Does Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer tend to say kind of wild and crazy things? Um, I don't know. I haven't studied enough Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. I just think, you know, it's sort of an interesting, interesting midrash. Um, I may be going out way too much on a limb to say that it's, gosh, you know, it's, if, you, if you know how, for example, the Zohar tends to interpret stuff, um, you know, it's sort of somewhere beyond... When I started looking at the Zohar seriously for the first time, I realized that it was simply a midrash. I mean, to say simply is a wrong word to use, but the point is, it's basically midrash, but it's taking it's taking the midrashic method, you know, into a much deeper ocean, and uh, and likewise, it seems to me that Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, from the little bit that I've read of it, tends to take things that are in Midrash Rabbah or, or the Tanhuma or stuff like that uh, into sort of deeper territory. It all, it all, if you haven't heard me share this before, this is all predicated on, a, a, which you, I think you will totally understand, a deep love of the text. You may have heard me say this before, that if you remember being in love and being in love and getting a letter from the person you love, you don't just read it once. You try to milk it for all the implications that it can have. And this is, this is a people that is in love with a text. These are love letters from God. The Torah is a love letter from God. That's what it is. A love letter from the divine. The book is on Safaria, the Pirkei. De Rabbi 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 yes, I, in fact, I... I think it's even in a PDF format, uh, even just, you know, I think it was translated some time ago. It is, but on Safari, you can jump to any chapter out of like 46 or something. And, right. and oh, wow. um, it's yeah. all like Midrash, Midrash and, Chag, and Agadic stuff. Yes. Well, whoever supports the, that uh, take on this would have to explain why the Torah doesn't tell us and Joseph became king of Egypt, because that's a kind of a big thing to leave out. Well, it could imply it in some of Joseph's policies towards the end, which are puzzling in the Torah itself, as to what he did with the land and how he, although he said he did it for Pharaoh. Okay, but those, that's sort of a very troubling, sort of a somewhat of a troubling passage when they run out of food and he basically, you know, he basically enslaves them. Enslaves, yeah. So, Again, you know, these are things to puzzle over. And uh, sometimes we'll find out later. Um, why doesn't the Torah explicit about it? 
I think that's a fairly straightforward question. I think there's lots that the Torah isn't explicit on, but some of the stuff that one can mine out of it are a little easier to, to see what's being said here. Um, I, I think if the Torah was so explicit, it wouldn't be as interesting. I think, you know, why do people do crossword puzzles? Why do people do Sudokus? Why do people do jigsaw puzzles? Because that's the way we're created. Not necessarily everybody, but there's a, it's a fairly human, human activity to try to solve mysteries and to solve puzzles that in some ways it's, you know, part of what makes life worth living. All right, let's see. I, we are running out of time. Uh, I guess I need to do a, I, I wanted to do this next one. Asher lo yada et Yosef, who did not know Joseph, to have a dami commanda lo yada me klal. He, he acted as if he didn't know him at all. Didn't know who this person was. So it also has some modern rings to it. Okay, so here we go. Uh, uh, the Torah Tamima. She shachach kol atovot shasa Yosef lemitzrayim. He forgot all the good things that Joseph did for Egypt. I mean, basically, he helped them survive. Udrashazo tisov lamanda amar. And this particular drash makes more sense. It, it sort of goes along with the one, who, the opinion that says, melech hadash shenit chadshu gzeirotav. That he, when it says Melachadash, it refers to the fact that he had whole brand new policies. As is explained in the previous drush. And, and it's clear, it's straightforward, that he is again making a diok. He's focusing on the language of Hanyan and the issue Asher Loyada, who did not know. The imka e al ha eder hakara bifnim, because if it was really talking about forgetting, in other words, the point of this drash is that he, he knew about Joseph. He 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 uh, he was aware of it. He just acted as if it wasn't there. That's it. So why? Because if it meant he really forgot Joseph, he really didn't know Joseph, he should have said, Asher lo he kir. He, he didn't recognize him. He didn't know who he was. And if it was to, if this phrase was coming to tell us that he didn't know anything about Joseph and his greatness, it's not possible. And I think this is something Lauren said yesterday. It doesn't make any sense. That he wouldn't have known of this amazing and important event that took place, the Korot Hamadina in the in the chronicles of the of the land. Ella al but you have to say it's a R fortiori. That he he acted, he is acting. He wasn't really there. He was acting as if he didn't recognize him. He didn't know Kamavuar, and as has been explained. So I think this is a good place. I'm going to stop the share here. And, and possibly. Yes. Another, another possibility of what it could mean that he didn't know Joseph is that he knew once Joseph took power, but he wasn't really privy on the inside information of the, the things that the relationship that Joseph had with the Pharaoh and the dreams and everything that led to his taking power. That he, you know, he, he knew Joseph because everybody knew Joseph once he was in charge, but not everybody knew why Joseph was in charge. Okay, uh, that's, that's a possibility. I, I would say, though, that it seems to me that the whole way in which Joseph came to power would be one of great interest. And, I mean, you know, when you read about stuff, it never seems as significant as when you're living through stuff. But when you consider 
uh, the degree of this famine that it had on the land of Egypt and the effect it might have had had Joseph not stepped in and 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 planned the policies. Uh, as I as I I think I've mentioned this before. You know, some just a few years ago, I came across some stuff about the French Revolution, and it was written by I don't can't think of the person's name on the history of the French Revolution. And lo and behold, I had no idea about this. And, and many of you may have known this. But when I was studying the French Revolution in high school, they never mentioned it that I recollect, because I'm pretty sure I was but what really got, you know, what I heard about was basically it was the bourgeoisie, and because they were somewhat impounded as opposed to the, you know, the other, the, the third estate, I think they called it, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they, they, they wanted to assume more power, but something like that, I'm oversimplifying. But what really, really, really tore at the fabric of French, of, and by the way, they liked the king. Most people were very happy with the king, okay? What tore it apart was this incredible famine that took place in France and in Europe at the time that absolutely destroyed the fabric of civilization. And I remember a phrase this particular person uses. He said, first of all, food became incredibly expensive. And he said, you couldn't even buy bad flour, you know, rotting flour for a lot of money. I'm just saying that maybe they didn't know about the dream, not that they didn't know oh. that he helped with the famine, but maybe yeah. they, Pharaoh didn't want them to know about his personal business. I think that might be putting some Western values on this. I don't know. I think it's a pretty fabulous story. That's why it's lasted this long. But maybe that's. I mean, what it, no, but I mean, you know, it's not like that's. I'm not suggesting for one second that that's, you know, untenable. I'm just saying, you know, you sort of have to weigh this. It's, but it is. I mean, look, I think you're trying to come up with a, a plausible explanation for what was going on. Let me put it this way. Lack of appreciation is like right out there. And we forget so quickly. We forget so quickly, you know, how things were when things get better. It's a sad commentary. Unless we intentionally make a point to keep it in mind. So, well, thank you all very much. I'm going to stop the recording and look forward to tomorrow.